I'm Ron Sasso. You're not. Um, um, here are the objectives. I just thought I'd throw them there in there. They're in your handout. Hopefully, I will hit all of them and maybe even some things that aren't on there. This here, this one of my, I, I, uh, this is a Rembrandt uh, painting, and this is uh, uh, Christ in the Sea of Galilee in the storm. And it's one that I, I really appreciate because here everybody is, is all panicked because everything's going on and, and Jesus is just, you know, chilling out back there. He's not worried. Um, and it's one of the things that we're going to kind of get into is, as far as just in general, the calm and the storm. And, and uh, to me, faith is important at the same time. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, you know, at this, I believe in higher power is important and, and focusing on that at times. But um, so just wanted to share that. Stress. Uh, stress is one of those things that when the body's stressed, hypothalamus signals autonomic nervous system, pituitary gland, and process of basically hormones are released, uh, typically the stress hormones. That starts this whole chain reaction. And that chain reaction, uh, basically, it affects the body. Now, I want to ask this question just generally. How many of you, when you first were, uh, symptoms first began, how many of you were dealing with an unusual amount, level of stress? OK. Uh, how many of you who weren't in that first group had always been dealing with a certain level of stress, type A type personality? OK. Uh, my, my feeling is that, uh, one, you know, stress, stress has such a huge role in autoimmune diseases, not just scleroderma, but autoimmune diseases. And, uh, and it's something that uh, when you look at, uh, I know for me, my stress level when I was, uh, uh, started having symptoms, and I know everybody probably, I, I look great, I'm doing well, I'm about a year and a half out, just started having a little bit of lung involvement. I'm a runner um, and in relatively good health. But uh, when mine hit, my stress level on a scale from 1 to 10 was probably, probably around a 12 uh, as far as my stress. And my 52 years was through the roof. So things that you look at, and it was an acute stress, but always was kind of more a type A personality. Um, interesting thing, and I'm just going to throw this out as a, just food for thought. Uh, I've worked in brain injury field, and, and that's what that CBIST stands for. Um, and one of the things I, because of that, had a lot of crossover with post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the things that I believe uh, is interesting, nobody really looks, has been looking as much at the relationship between the emotional component of autoimmune diseases and how that affects the body. And that's one of the things that, from my standpoint, I think there's a very good likelihood that uh, there is a link, just like post-traumatic stress disorder affects the body, that because our genetics, everybody's genetics being a little different, autoimmune diseases and stress, well, they come out differently in different people. And even though we've also seen that, for instance, in some families, they, you know, they say, well, it doesn't seem like there should be a link with certain types of autoimmune diseases because we can't seem to find some of those genetic links, but they seem to run in families. Well, I don't know about you, but if somebody in my family is dealing with a problem and it's not me, it's still my problem, you know? So families, a lot of times, will share stress. So that's one of the things. Just to kind of keep that in, in the back of your head, I believe it's something that uh, 
will over time, I think, should be researched a little more. And I'll just throw out one little piece of information. I looked at a, uh, I'm not a researcher, that's, that's not my forte, but did look at, uh, there was a study done with um, active duty uh, military that were deployed and they were looking at um, incidence rates of autoimmune diseases and uh, they took active duty who were deployed and they were looking primarily for dust going to Iraq. And um, that, what was interesting, they had two groups, their control group were the active duty who weren't deployed to Iraq. What they found, one, was that military had a slightly higher incident rate than the general population, which was not really surprising. What was a little surprising was that there was a slightly higher rate for those who were not deployed than those who were deployed. Talking with people in the military field, when you ask some, a soldier, what's more stressful, being deployed to a military zone or the possibility that you could be deployed at any point? That possibility, that anxiety, that stress, that's much more stressful. So to me, that just further validates that. So. Okay, stress in the body. And I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but what I want you to do is take a look at some of this and how it relates to scleroderma. This is just what stress does to the body. You know, muscles tighten up uh, and can be tightened, lead to uh, headaches, chronic pain, respiratory system. Um, yeah, that's dangerous there, so I, I almost, I tripped over that before, so. Uh, <laughs> respiratory system stress uh, will make you breathe harder, uh, which is particularly bad when you already have a compromised immune system. So in panic attacks, asthma attacks, cardiovascular uh, can cause problems, heart, blood vessels, endocrine when the body stress, hypothalamus, again, the whole fight or flight uh, response, um, and also uh, sends more glucose to the body. Gastrointestinal. Esophagus, you know, you might eat more, eat less, and this is one where it's a little different with, with scleroderma, but um, you can experience uh, heartburn, more heartburn and acid reflux. And, and then stomach. Uh, you know, you'll feel more of the butterflies in the stomach potentially uh, and more stomach pain you can have with or without ulcers. Bowel uh, affects digestion, what your body you know, will absorb and uh, it can have diarrhea or constipation. Now, I know nobody has experienced any of these, right? I, I was going to say, you know, um, just... Yeah, exactly. It's, to me, it's very interesting when you start looking at how stress affects the body and, and you could be reading some of this stuff and be, be thinking, oh, wait, oh, are these scleroderma symptoms? Yeah. You know, so yeah. Uh, nervous system uh, also has several different divisions. Um, autom autonomic nervous system, uh, sympathetic nervous system, and parasympathetic nervous system. Um, basically, again, with the, uh, when the body is stressed, it generates signals and the fight or flight response. And the uh, adrenal glands, uh, adrenaline and cortisol, uh, stress hormone, are released. Heart beats faster, respiration rate increase, blood vessels and the arms dilate. The yeah, digestive processes change glucose is shot into the bloodstream, basically designed to deal with an emergency. And it's fairly sudden, you know, this type of uh, experience is fairly sudden. But there are also different types of stress. Usually when you have a, a quick stressor, your body will gradually go back to normal. Now, chronic stress, experience stressors over a prolonged period of time, uh, creates a drain on the body. So, and that triggers physical reactions. 
Uh, and, you know, the nervous system being involved, uh, but the continuous activation of that. The nervous system is great, it's resilient, but it's what happens to the body. That's the challenge. So types of stress, acute stress, um, momentary short-term stress, and I'll get into a few of those. Basically, those, those things, they come and they go. Uh, that fight or flight response. And there again, when we talk about that fight or flight response, that's something that uh, you don't have to be in a fight and you don't have to be running. But still, that's what your body is responding. And then chronic stress um, over a prolonged period of time, that creates more problems for the body. Uh, and just having those systems you know, going, constantly going, it really does take a toll. Uh, increases the risk for hypertension, heart attack, stroke. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. And, and there are, there are, hmm? Chronic stress can, and acute stress can, and one of the things that I want to cover, too, thank you for your question, because um, what the rain outs. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. You know, with the autoimmune disease, with the rain outs, with that, your, your body's system is still compromised. It's still affected. Medically, that's still there. That's still happening, you know. If you manage your stress perfectly, you still have that underlying condition. It doesn't go away. It doesn't, it, I'm not saying that you can get rid of it, but what I'm saying is you can minimize it. And you can, ideally, you're going to limit those flare-ups. Now, in acute stress, uh, sandwich police, I'm sorry, I just love this. Um, but here, I had an example of a stressor that I had. I was driving, and um, I didn't have a picture of the police car that pulled me over. But uh, needless to say, I was going a little fast. I was going up to my church to see my uh, pastor who was giving his last sermon. Uh, he was dying of cancer and pretty much knew it was going to be his last sermon, which it was. Um, because I was having some stomach issues that morning, I was running a little late. So I'm driving a little faster. I get pulled over. I'm suddenly totally overwhelmed because on the one hand, here, you know, here I am, I'm, and this was in my first year of, of after being diagnosed, so I'm still overwhelmed. I'm thinking, OK, about my pastor. He's dying. I'm thinking, hey, I might be in the same boat. I want to be there. And then this officer is just you know, pulls me over. I explain, didn't matter. He's writing a ticket. All right, you know, and I'm like, oh, great. And then he's, it seemed like he was taking as long as he possibly could. At one point, I'm ready to get out of my car. And then I think, oh, wait, in this day and age, no, that's bad. Do not get out of your car to walk, you know, just thinking, okay, I don't want to freak him out. So anyway, I finally get my ticket. I'm on my way. But the interesting thing, I realize my body now, now after this feels horrible. I'm suddenly feeling 10 times worse because I wasn't in the moment handling that stress. That stress was taking over for my body, you know? And that, that's one of the things that those unexpected stressors, those, those are also ones that we have to deal with, you know? Uh, and that's, that's one of the challenges. And, and if you think if you're just driving along and you're having your, say, you, you had a sandwich and you're eating and you get pulled over by the sandwich police and they're trying to confiscate your sandwich, you know, that would be stressful. But, um, but yeah, you, you just, to keep, keep this in mind that, that stress, stressors 
can, can happen all different types. But that would be a good example of an acute stress. Um, now, also, uh, stress does affect male and female reproductive systems. And uh, I know there aren't a lot of guys in here, but uh, you know, this, is, this is something most people are pretty aware of. Um, and pretty much almost all the body systems act and react uh, to stress. So now, scleroderma, is that stressful? <laughs> I mean, having a chronic disease is stressful. So it's interesting because you have chronic stress and a chronic disease, and that causes stress. Now, too much stress, obviously, bad thing. So big thing is not to panic. Um, and as you can see, there, there, there were, there were a, few, a few shots at Santa, you know, but um, he, he did OK. Uh, at least in this picture, there, there is another picture, but I didn't include that in this show. Uh, anyway, yeah, my, my kids wanted to, uh, wanted to play with the, the, the Santa they had. Um, OK, one of the tools looking at just as an idea that when it comes to trying to figure out your stress level and how you're doing, Sometimes trying to find something that is a little more objective way of dealing with it. Uh, for instance, you know, this uh, SUD scale. And SUD scale is something that was developed by Joseph Wolpe. It's been around for a while. The D is usually distress or disturbance. It's been used for anxiety more. Um, but I actually, I look at it. I changed the D in my head to discomfort. So score 0 to 10, and 10 being horrible. And kind of like when you go to the doctor sometimes, what's your pain level? 0 to 10. You know, and you really don't want to have a 10. You know, it's not like, oh, 10 is really good. Um, but in this case, it's one of those where you can during the course of a day, be thinking, OK, what's my stress level? Where am I at? Am I at a, you know, a 2? Or am, am I at a 7? And there's a big difference. Part of one, of the, one of the things I've started doing is each day I'm recording a score for myself. Now, the scores are very subjective. They're still what you are, you are feeling and how you're feeling on a given day. And during the course of the day, that will change. But it can also tell you a little bit as far as trends, too. If you, if you see changes in what's happening or if you're handling your stress better. So, but I use it for my body as well in thinking about my discomfort. So something that you can do. Now, um, how that score might change, part of it and part of it is for awareness, to become more aware of how you are feeling. So how does your score vary? You know, think about what your score is right now. If you had to, had to rate, rate yourself, at this moment, having to deal with listening to me right now, you know, and trying to track me as I kind of pace back and forth a little bit. You know, what's your stress level? Now, also think about it. You just had a, say if you had a, a test result and you're waiting for the results, where's your stress level, your SUDS level going to be? Chances are it's going to be a little higher. So these are things that to be aware of and take a moment to kind of check that out in your, your own system. Uh, now, 
who here has noticed that your pain discomfort increases when you worry? Yeah. It's one of those realities that your body, as you worry and you stress about things, your body will, you know, be more uncomfortable. So, um, being aware of changes can help you make adjustments on how you handle your stress. By the way, one of the things, I'm just going to digress for a brief moment because I feel like it. And I don't want to be stressed about my presentation and making sure I'm on, on tack. Uh, one, sometimes you have to look at the little things, and I'll get into this a little more, but you know what my favorite color is? Huh? Teal? Teal has always been. Yeah, teal, those kind of shades, have always been one of my favorite colors. And I think, wow, what a weird blessing that disease that I get, which is horrible, you know, it has my favorite color. I mean, you know, it just, it wouldn't quite work if, I mean, pink, pink is not really so much my color. You know, there's certain colors that just wouldn't work, but I like, you know, yeah. I mean, anyway, just sometimes the little things in life, but. So, sorry, I felt like digressing. Now, adjusting to your situation sometimes and being aware of it, and by the way, everybody knows where the real cat is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My, my daughter had a, a, a pretty serious collection of stuffed animals. Huh? Yeah. The, the, yes. And that's one of my, one of my uh, cats in there that is just kind of uh, buried in there. And I, I couldn't resist taking the picture. So, yeah. So, but sometimes you, you have to adapt to your situation and, and adjust a little, a little differently. So mindfulness, okay. What is mindfulness? Um, <laughs> yes, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist on that one because, you know, I, I'm one of those. I'm one of those people. I'm not a fan of things that sound new age. Mindfulness. When I first heard the term, I was like, you know, wanted a bomb. I'm like, oh, it just sounds so. Eh. Well, mindfulness is a little different than than that. Even though I love, I love that slide. It just kind of fits. Um, being aware of something, having a state of consciousness, or this is actually really what we're looking for, achieving one's focus of awareness on the present moment while calmly, calmly acknowledging and accepting your feelings, thoughts, bodily sensations. Now, how many of you, and I'm figuring probably most of you, have at various times, you suddenly feel some discomfort and you think, oh no, is this going to be, things are going to get worse? I mean, yeah. Well, very early on, that was one of the first things I started thinking. I'm like, okay, I, I'd have something. You start feeling like, okay, this is the sign. Things are going to get worse. And then I start thinking, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, I used to work with people dealing with stress and, and worked on relaxation techniques and so forth. And I start thinking, when you start thinking, oh, this is going to get worse, you're basically telling your body, hey, yeah, come on. Yep, this is what I'm expecting. So go ahead, show it to me. Yeah. Instead, with mindfulness, the idea is, OK, that's an interesting sensation. Yeah, that's kind of unusual. But it's almost you're taking yourself out of the situation of that's you, I mean, it's still you, you're still aware of it, you're still, you want to be aware of changes in your body as they happen, but not be worrying about them. Not, it, not 
from the sense of, oh, what's going to happen? Oh, my. And yes, if you have a change in your body and something's happening, yes, you want to talk to your doctor. You want to do that. But, okay, who has had worry actually improve their condition on anything? No. Worry, worry is basically uh, our, our body systems just kind of making us more aware of a problem. But it doesn't improve our body. So mindfulness, some of the key thoughts, remain calm. You don't want to stress out. You want to remain calm and be aware of your situation. Look at your situation objectively. So that's part of it. And consider bodily changes as something happening, not just something happening to you. Now, for instance, with being pulled over, by a police officer. Now, if I was in that moment and using mindfulness, I would be thinking, yes, this is inconvenient. OK. I am likely going to be late. And you try to objectively think, well, I believe they are videotaping that session and so forth, and think, OK. It was his last sermon. I'll, I will still be seeing that. I'll get there. I will be late. But that's OK. And yes, I'll have a, ex, a, an expensive speeding ticket. But also being aware that how your body reacts, what it's feeling. And review those different sensations objectively. Now, when you're reviewing your bodily sensations as they happen, you, know, you can implement different techniques to start diminishing your stress. Meditation. Okay. Now, some people will use music and listen and kind of close their eyes and just relax and drift off. Whatever it may be, you might focus on an object. Wait, you know, listening to waves, um, whatever it may be. Yes. <laughs> sure. When you were talking about fire flying, there is often the idea that there's also a third line called freezing, you know, where a person stays stagnant wherever they are. You know, when you're in that type of mode, Okay. Um, how do you move out of the, you know, from the fight or flight to? Well, your 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 body is still your body is still reacting. Yeah, you know, your body, all all those your systems, um, your body is still doing damage uh, in in some way to to the system. So, part of that, uh, if you are in a, a freezing, you still want to get your body out of that fight or flight freezing system, you know, uh, uh, state. You want to get yourself to a point where, and, and here's the thing, when fight or flight happens, you know, you've got your amygdala is kicking in, you know, which is a very primitive part of the brain. And th that's part of it, that fight, fight or flight, or, or if you're freezing, um, it's all emotional. And it's emotional overload. What you're not using is your executive functioning. 
you're not using your higher level in your brain to start deciphering what's really going on. And so if you take an actual situation of fight or flight, you know, where somebody's coming at a person and they've got a knife and, and they're, you know, either they're running away or they're going to fight or they're freezing, well, chances are they're overloaded. Uh, and actually one of the things with uh, brain injury, which I worked in, uh, there would be catastrophic reactions. Uh, and that's something I used to present on quite a bit, where a person would be overloaded. And sometimes a person could blow up, get angry, or they shut down and they freeze. And just basically lights on, nobody's home, no information's getting in. Yeah, that, that happened to my daughter last year. Um, at the last conference, we were in an accident on a trolley, and she was in shock. Her every, everything shut down. Um, she could not handle stress very well at all at that time with, the, with all, everything going on. Um, since then, she's learned techniques, so that's why I'm here to help her learn more. But um, it does happen, but you can help improve yourself. So, but she did have a brain injury previously as well, but so yeah. it's hard to say if it was the scleroderma stress related or the combination. But. Well, and I, I will, I'm going to say one of, one of the things, yeah, one of, one of the things that I've, I've seen on some message boards too and that uh, a lot of times people will start saying, oh, hey, I think my you know, uh, cognitive functioning being affected by the scleroderma. Well, there's not much out there that really indicates that. But what I will say, as somebody who worked in brain injury, who's been diagnosed with systemic scleroderma, that my first year, I knew I was moderately depressed just dealing with it. Cognitively, was I as sharp? Well, depression and also anxiety will affect how sharp you are. If your brain is, in the bu is busy trying to process other information, you're in overload. You're not going to be in that moment. You're not going to be focused on the here and now because you're trying to think of all these different things, the what ifs. You're not focused on the moment. And that's one of, that's one of the challenges. So, um, you know, in a fight or flight, yeah, you, you, you're, you're in that moment. But whether or not your executive functioning is thinking through the situation of what can I do? I've got this person coming at me with a knife. What do I do? Um, you know, sometimes it may not be a, a fight, flight, or something else. It might be if your executive function kicks in, hey, oh, why don't I call 911? <laughs> well, what I see yeah. from like, my patients is that, you know, a lot of times it's not the patient themselves, it's the caregivers that are, you know, they're feeling the empathy and things like that but of the person that actually has the disease, and they go on emotional overload. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are playing those board games and stuff. But the, the patients themselves aren't communicating to the caregiver where they are each day. Yeah. You know, and that's an important, important thing. Where are you on your scale of 0 to 10? And what can I do to help you bring that emotional state down? Yeah. And that's a lot, of, a lot of the communication, a lot of being aware of different, different things. And it, it is. A challenge, and I. I had a really good example. You just say that you had just been with Burger Wright, and most of me and asked Burger Wright about me. Actually, I've been here and asked Burger Men. But um, with them, I wish that all of them could have joined this class because for some reason, you know how men are, you are a man, they don't want to, especially they have to worry a lot. And that's the bad thing about it, is they don't handle it for their own life. So when you're going through this, you're able to 
too big for the two because I've had so many and it's really hard. They're, they're just stuck to get away from their doctor. It's it's a different it's a different mindset. Yeah, so. and I wish they could all be in that as well as us with you know, it's, it's sad to me too. As soon as I see a male who doesn't even want to be even dress and even ask for it, he doesn't want somebody worrying and distressing their mind. Check one, check one. Doctor, if you can repeat the question just briefly, then the people on the video will be able to understand what the, you're asking, oh. please. Yes, thank you. Um, but yeah, actually, that was one of the things as far as dealing with men and scleroderma, and, that, and typically a lot of times men are not as willing to uh, address the problem. Usually it's more, okay, you tough things out. And, and I, will, I will say, initially, before I knew what I was dealing with, I was, I'm a runner. I still am. I ran this morning. Uh, saw a coyote, uh, you know, on my run. I was going to say uh, maybe somebody had their, lost their dog, but there were no tags on it. Um, I wanted to get a picture of it, but I couldn't. It, you know, I think I might have gotten a tail or something. It was running off. But uh, to me, I was still, I was still dealing with pain. I was running about, uh, I had trimmed my mileage to maybe three miles. I had to run in the afternoon because my joints were inflamed. And I didn't realize what I had. And I'm like, OK, is this a running injury? It didn't feel like it. But, uh, and I typically, I'd be like, OK, three miles, excruciating pain. That's about all I could do. But also, I've run marathons before, so my pain tolerance is pretty good. So. But I know I want to make sure I cover more stuff that I've got in here. And I will, and this way I can, I'll, I'll stay like forever to answer questions afterwards too, uh, just so you know. But OK, meditation, you know, visualization. One of the things that uh, you can do as well to relax. And give you a little sample of visualization uh, if okay if I just say okay close your eyes and imagine yourself you're on a a warm beach with ocean waves in the background your body feels nice and comfortably warm you know, you hear those waves, maybe a bird in the background, and you feel at peace. You know, your body doesn't feel cold in any way, shape, or form. You're comfortable. You feel the sun, and it's a beautiful day. Okay, that's just a brief sample. You can open your eyes again, but you can do you can take yourself to any place where you're comfortable in your mind. And you can create, if you have a place that you know you enjoy, imagine being there. But when you imagine and you visualize that, visualize yourself healthy. Visualize yourself doing well. Don't just, OK, you visualize yourself as, as you are struggling on a given day. You visualize yourself better. Because there's a lot to be said about the power of positive thinking and the body and how that affects the body in much the same way as stress will affect the body in a negative way. Um, progressive muscle relaxation, basically, that's one where you start tightening up muscles, you know, and you can go. Basically, from your toes, work your way up. Um, and you, you hold it for a few seconds, let it go. Hold it a few seconds, let it go. And gradually, that will help, uh, help some people relax. Yoga. Um, I don't know if anybody has done the yoga in the morning. OK. Um, Yoga is one of those things I should do. I have not done. Um, but I, it's on my list of things to do. My level of flexibility 
uh, is kind of amazing. No, I, I won't even do this. I was going to bend down to try to touch my toes, but um, I, I can. I can touch my toes. You want to see? OK. That's about the extent of it. If I go this way, that's about, that's about as good as I get. Um, but from the time I was about 12 years old, I couldn't touch my toes. So, but I'm a runner, so I've got, I think I've got a lot of scar tissue in the back of my leg. So I can bend my legs the other way better, but still not flexible. So um, yoga, very, very good and also can be good for relaxation. Now, this is my favorite, deep breathing. Uh, probably because, one, it's simple. You can do it anywhere, absolutely anywhere. Uh, and you can see results. One of the, and, uh, oh, sorry, Yogi, the bear. Couldn't resist throwing that in there. Um, but deep breathing, big thing is it can be done anywhere, including a job interview. Big thing is, as long as you do not, when you, you breathe in and you let it out, as long as you don't let it out as a sigh, <laughs> then you can get away with it. But uh, one of the things I used to do is when I was first trying to figure out uh, a little bit more of body, I would go to Walmart. I didn't have a blood pressure cuff at this time. This is going back quite a few years. And I'd go to Walmart, which is stressful anyway. And I'd go check my blood pressure. And then I, what I would do would be trying to lower my blood pressure, just start doing deep breathing. And basically, when you do that, you're getting biofeedback with your blood pressure. And yeah, you have to wait some time to do it again and lower it, but that's one of the things. I, I, had, a, I had a fun experience uh, several years ago. I had a, a psychiatrist was showing some uh, system that uh, worked with EEGs and handling stress and would have a, a, a balloon and basically, if you were handling your stress well, the balloon would fly. And if you were under stress, it would crash. And he said, OK, who's having a lot of stress? And at that time, this pre-scleroderma, but I was having a bad day. It was very stressful. Uh, I went up. I said, sure, me, OK. Hooks me up, and balloon's flying fine. He says, uh, you're doing really well. And I said, oh. Am I supposed to focus on my stress? He said, yeah, well, why, don't you, why don't you try that? I crashed the balloon almost instantaneously. Uh, but that's also one of the challenges, though. Sometimes we can, there, that being aware of stress, and you know, sometimes you can put stress out here, but it's still affecting you. You really have to be more neutral. And that's probably one of the things I've learned a little more having autoimmune disease, so scleroderm. Um, now, one of the things, too, with the deep breathing, it gets oxygen to your brain, which kind of kickstarts your executive functioning in your frontal lobes. Uh, it stimulates your autonomic nervous system, which lowers your blood pressure. So and here's an example of some deep breathing. Uh, this COPD foundation, breathe in through your nose as if you're smelling something for two seconds. Pucker your lips as though you're blowing out candles on a birthday cake. Breathe out slowly through pursed lips two to three times as long as you breathe in. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, the more you do that deep breathing exercise, and I do it pretty, I'll just keep doing long, deep breath in, slow out. And while doing that, I also will think I'm relaxing. As I'm blowing out, 
I'll be thinking I'm blowing out the stress that's coming out of just. Sometimes you have to do that, and it can help. Now, exercise. Um, she's furry. She's not. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't able to use my treadmill that day. Um, yes. The, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of exercise. Now, I know not everybody can exercise, but moving as much as you can is important. Uh, some things that, and there are two, two things I'm going to throw out. Sometimes I think as I go, so I apologize. As a, one of the things that um, you have to you know, talk to your doctor, see what you can do, what you're able to do. Try to move as much as you can. And as you keep doing that, set your goal. Wherever you are, OK, say, yeah, I want, I want to do that. Let me do a little bit more than that. Not a lot more, but a little more. If you have a great day, you want to be careful not to overdo it. You still want to be as consistent as possible. Because if you overdo it, you're stressing your body. Now, as a runner and a guy with testosterone, I, I, I ran nine marathons in my life, full marathons. I really would like to get to 10. I don't think I ever will, because running a marathon is one thing. The training for a marathon is stressful, even if you're just doing it to finish. And so emotionally, oh yeah, I would love to do a 10th marathon. My executive functioning says, bad move, really bad, don't do it. Stick to half marathons, you know, less stress on the body. So try to find out, exercise as much as you can. Um, one of the things exercise does help with the removal of stress hormones. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea to be running with the bulls, but, um, but yeah, it does, it does help. So um, consider tracking. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of running, activity tracking, so forth. Uh, if sometimes having that, that monitor, being able to say, OK, I'm doing this much. Can I keep doing this, or can I do a little bit more? I believe it helps. Uh, for me, now, I'm very fortunate. I'm doing well. This is kind of what I did over a 12-month span. Uh, there's a lot of steps, a lot of miles. But also, that was me healthy. Now, I don't have the months, a couple months prior to that. Just I didn't think about taking a picture of that. But there was a pretty significant drop uh, when I initially was diagnosed and had issues. But one thing that I, why this is up here is, if you notice, yeah, there's some bumps and so forth, pretty consistent. I have a high level of activity, but I try to keep it consistent. I try not to do too much, try not to do too little. Consistency, because also the more consistent you are with your body, the less stress it's under. Now, this is me. And that was me 2016. I was really thrilled. I got second place there, got a little spike in this race. It was a 10.4 mile race. Now, 
Same age group, got first this year, but it was like six minutes slower. But it was hotter, and then I had to think about it. I'm like, you know, the good thing was it was hot, and there were a lot of people who were smarter and stayed home and didn't run. That's why I got first. Um, but, but one of the things I also learned, even competing, when I talk about listening to the body, is even for, for me, very competitive. I, had a, I ran a half marathon where I, before I was diagnosed, I had run a half marathon about hour 45 minutes just under that, which is really good, just under an eight minute pace. And when I was diagnosed and had issues, I thought there's no way I'm ever going to be faster than I was. And I had about a six week span where I had very little symptoms at all. Like my muscles weren't getting tight or anything. I was like, wow, this is weird. And I trained and I felt good. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to try and break one hour, 40 minutes for a half marathon. I went up to this race and I, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I think I can do this. I think I've got the training underneath me. I think I can do this. And there's part of me, I'm thinking this could be my last chance at this. The gun goes off by about mile three or four. I'm thinking I should drop because my body felt so horrible. And I made the decision not to drop. Instead, I thought, I'm going to tough this thing out. I'm going to run this, because this may be the last time I get a chance to do it. That was the testosterone thing. Um, I didn't break 140. It was like 140 and 51 seconds. So it was close to my goal. But I worked 10 times harder than I ever would have. Then I talked to a couple runners that I went up with. I said, how was I this morning? Did I seem stressed? Oh, yeah. I got some external feedback. And both were saying, oh, yeah, you were very stressed. You were because I wanted to hit a goal. I wanted to hit a goal and wanted to push myself. And as a result, it hit my body. So next time I raced, I, instead I set three goals for myself. One I knew I could get, another one I figured I could, and one I thought, nah, maybe, maybe not. And I hit them all. But I also wasn't locked in. I didn't care what my time was. It just being more mindful, just what is, is. And you let it go. You don't try not to let yourself stress about too much. And that's, it's a hard thing, but you can do it. So other thing, do not take life too seriously, you know. Um, by the way, that's my therapy cat. Uh, I, I refer to her as my therapy cat. Um, yeah, she's very, very weird. And, and um, you know, you want to chill out. That's her as a kitten. I did not think she would be as big of a cat, but she was in the fridge at that time. So, um, but, but just in general, you want to enjoy life as much as you can. Okay, who here, since your diagnosis, looks at life a little differently? I mean, I know for me, when it rains, I'm smelling the rain. If there's something unusual, I'm noticing it. And sometimes those are, those are things that, even though you may not feel good in a given day, you try, try to, try to experience the simple joys in life as you can. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that and that's yeah. 
optimism is so much more important as far as how you view life. Um, you know, again, enjoying the little things in life. I don't know how many of you have seen white squirrels. Okay. Yeah. Not digitally altered. That is a white squirrel. Um, yeah, actually, in that that was in my hometown, Rapid City, South Dakota. We actually have several. No idea. I, you know, I mean, but. Nope. Uh, we have we have gray and we have red and white, yeah. so um, yeah. So anyway, very interesting. But yeah, yeah. He posed for that. I was appreciative. So um, this is kind of one of the things I I have as my own little mantra for slur dumber to relax, pray, and keep moving. And main, main reason because you need to relax before doing anything, you know, and pray, you know, whether it be to God or another higher power because that, there's so much that's out of our control. And to realize that we are, we're, a part of this, and a lot of times we don't know why we're put into situations we are, why we're given the challenges we're given. You know, at the same time, we, you move forward. Um, and like I say, I'm doing well right now. Yeah, and I know I just, I recent PFT, I've got some lung involvement. I can still run and run well. But I know, okay, I've got to stay on top of that. But guess what? I'll stay on top of it and get it checked out. But at the same time, I'm not going to stress about it. Just do something about it, and hey, it will happen. And keep moving. Um, last year at the conference, I had an experience where uh, I went into an elevator, and there's a person who moved in the elevator and was moving as well as I was. And at that point, I was only maybe six months in, but was fortunate. And I said, patient, presenter. They're like, patient, OK. What are you doing? And, and you know, what do you have? And they said, systemic, 20-something years. I'm like, what are you doing? Floor stops. She goes to get out. She says, just keep moving, and just drift it off. I still have no idea whether or not that was a real person or whether or not it was an angel sent, you know, because I didn't see her again, you know. But to me, that's one of the things I know if I, when I get up in the morning, I'm stiff. My joints crack. My wife sometimes will say, oh, you, you move too much, you know, you're, you're, you're running too much. I'm like, no, I feel better after I run. I feel better when I'm moving. It's when I sit that it's hard. And so keep that, keep that in mind, to keep moving and know that there's a purpose in life. So um, questions? Yes. And, 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 and that's, you know, one of the things that, you, you know, bringing up caregivers and the challenges that caregivers have, uh, just because I wanted to repeat some of that information for the video, but challenges that caregivers have and um, worrying. Caregivers have to take care of themselves, too. They have to manage their stress. And one of the things is that when you start looking at, as I mentioned earlier, that autoimmune diseases seem to run in families because that stress. You start worrying about, about your daughter. 
you know, there are those possibilities because stress plays such a huge role. And the, the reality is that any of us, I mean, we're here today, and at the same time, we can walk out the door, we can be crossing the road, be hit by a car. I mean, you know, we, nobody, nobody is promised tomorrow. You need to enjoy today, live in the moment, and, not, and manage your stress. Take a deep breath. Don't let the stress manage you.